Not a lot of students so far. In one place or the other, I am trying to did, there were two parts to it. There was the um, going through my notes. This is the last lecture in this section of the class. And when I looked at my notes, I realized there's no way I'm going to get through all of these notes if I write it all on the board. It's too many pages of notes. So what I decided to do on Monday was to go through my handwritten notes that, that are on the, the Canvas page. And we did that. We got all the way to the end and even had a few minutes left over. And there was more than one student who said, this is all very good, but I don't know how to use that spreadsheet to analyze a trust that I designed. And that was in a lecture um, it's lecture number two of the five in this set, in this part of the class. But we did 10 minutes of um, how you use that uh, spreadsheet to set up your particular trust. So that's what I'm going to end with. And that's, that took exactly the 50 minutes we had on, on Monday. Okay.
So that's the plan. I'll wait. Hey, welcome. And have I gotten a name tag for you? Okay, your name's Gabriel. had time to talk with your group mates about your particular also blue bridge design. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not. <laughs> not so much, huh? Well, I look at the schedule and the way I see the schedule is two weeks from today and two weeks from Monday. We are somehow, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do it, but we're going to break your bridges, meaning that we're going to have to build them uh, in the next two weeks, design them and build them. I think what we might do, just to be consistent with uh, how we're doing the presentations, I think we might, we're both going to be doing, we're going to do the breaking and the presenting. And the presenting is really just a short presentation that introduces introduces your group and tells us who did what. And then it just shows us it, it's, a, it's a simple presentation, but it, it is useful for the class to see uh, the various something about the various designs. What what I think might work is if we the bridges are here. And uh, I will, with an assistant, take care of setting them up in the testing device and then breaking. And then rather than have you, everyone in the class coming up and giving a presentation here, and it's just going to be a lot of mixing people up, it seems to me it would be safer to have a Zoom call going between 3222 and down here. And you do the breaking down here on one Zoom call and the presenting up there on the other. That's that's my plan. I think that I've never done it that way before, but I think that should work. Uh, and it, it, like I said, it just minimizes the people moving back and forth uh, with within one another. Okay, that's two weeks from today. Hello, that's a familiar face. Griffin, that's Griffin Lewis. Griffin. I don't think I have a name tag. I came in a little bit left out. Okay, so if you would make up something like that for me. All right, so what I said was we're going to go through a long set of notes that I have. I'm just going to lecture off the notes and then we'll finish the class with a little bit of using the trust analyzer to create um, create a, a trust of our own design. All right, so this is the first page of those notes. And what I say here is I'm just going to give a little intro from what we've done the previous weeks. That's on the next page here. So we're going through a procedure for calculating a trust strength, and we do that by assuming an, an applied load, and then based on the characteristics of the trust, we go through and calculate all of the member strengths one by one. And then a separate analysis, we go through and calculate the load on each member. Then at that point, we have both the strengths and the loads for every member. We can calculate a safety factor that is the ratio of the strength of the member to the to the load that's on that particular member. 
And once we have that information, we can calculate the, the strength of the truss as the applied load times the minimum value of the safety factor. And the topic for today is how to do that calculation of the load on each member for any statically determinant truss. That's what's going on in the, in the truss analyzer. Start off with a simple example of, of a problem like that. Say we've got a, a triangular truss that has three nodes, one, two, three, and three members, one, two, and three. And you'd be given the load on the truss F and based upon the position of the nodes, you'd calculate the angles A1, A2, A3. So all of that is given. And what we're wanting to find are six unknowns, the three internal member forces, one, two, and three, which I'm calling here M, one, two, and three, plus the X component and the Y component of the pin reaction force, which I'm assuming is here on the left, and then the, the roller is, uh, has no X component, it only has a Y component. So collectively that's six unknowns. And I'm using the convention that if uh, the magnitude of that internal member force is greater than zero, then it's compressive, that is it's pushing on the nodes. If the magnitude of the internal member force is less than zero, it's a tensile load, it's pulling on the member. And so, imagine if we were to solve this problem and we, uh, what we could do is, we know we have six equations we can write. That is, uh, sum of the forces is in the X and the sum of the forces in the Y at each of the nodes. So at each of the nodes, we have two equations. If we just looked at a particular uh, node to see, okay, you've all, or those of you who've had statics, you know that problems can be simple or hard depending on the strategy that you take in solving the problem. And if you're only going to use uh, static equilibrium, that is, we're going to use only the method of joints, it's important that we that we start at a place where we, we don't have too many unknowns. So for instance, if we started at node two, we'd have one, we'd have these two internal member forces and a roller force as our unknowns. We'd only have two equations, so we'd, we'd be in trouble. But if we start at node three, we're given the applied load. We have two unknown member forces, M3 and M2. And so we have two equations and two unknowns, and we can solve for those two unknowns. We're not going to actually do it. This is all just sort of talking conceptually here. And then once we have that information, we could go on to node two. Again, we have two equations. Now we can use the M2 that we calculated previously. And if you go to node two, so now we know this value and our two unknowns, M1 and R, we're gonna solve for those and um, we've got two equations to do it. So we're good. And then finally we can, step three, we can go to that final node now that we know M1 and we know M3, and we can use our two equations to solve P sub X and P sub Y. So that's, that's a method of joints uh, analysis technique for a triangular truss, and I, right? This is familiar to you, right? All right, so now um, let's go on to a larger truss. All right, so here's our larger truss. Uh, one of the ones that's in truss analyzer, it's got 
it's got seven members and five nodes. And uh, from our previous talk on static, uh, static determinancy, we know that this is a statically determinant trust. That is two times the number of nodes, two times five equals the number of members plus three. So two times five is 10, seven plus three is 10. That's the, that's the quantitative uh, condition for static determinancy. There's also just the, the qualitative, take a look at it. Does it, is every bit of it uh, made up of triangles? Yes or no? Nods in the audience to say, yes, it is. And do we see any cases where, where members come together to form an X anywhere on this truss? No. So that's my qualitative rules. If it's all triangles and there are no X's anywhere, then it's statically determinant. So you could imagine, imagine a, a truss that's rectangular with two diagonal members. That you can show is a statically indeterminate truss, even though it's all triangles. And that's what that second condition is for. <coughs> To, um, to, to avoid that situation. And you could see that by simply pulling out one of those members, uh, you can make something statically determinate. All right, so it is statically determinate. And now let's try to find all the, the, um, the axial member loads and the reaction forces without relying on any moment balances or any sort of symmetry assumption. Okay, those are two techniques that you used in statics to solve these trust problems. And the 10 unknowns that we have, we're gonna call M1 through M7, PX, PY, and R. All right, so I would propose that it can't be done. I have looked at it and I don't see any way to solve this one using just the method of joints. Uh, regardless of where you, which node you start with. You take any node, let's say, let's take node two. We're, we're given the applied load, but we have three unknowns. If we start down here, uh, we have these two internal member forces. Every single, every single node has more than two unknowns. Unknown. So there's no way to do it node by node. We know we can do it because we have, it is statically determinate. We have enough equations, but we have to do it all 10 equations at once. We can't do it uh, in, in smaller subsets of analysis. All right, and so here's me just um, going through particular cases saying without using the moment balance, we just can't solve this. And the way to do it is to make a bigger system of equations. So make a a system of equations that uses all of the nodes at once into a 10 equation, 10 unknown system of equations. That will work, that will work. They're all linear equations. It can be solved. And I'm just gonna show you how you do that uh, using linear algebra and to do that, um, I'm, just, I'm curious as to how many of the folks here have had something, either not a full linear algebra class or have dealt with matrices before we have. Okay, okay. So you, I think it's common to get little bits and pieces of linear algebra or, or take the full class. I, so McKenna, you had it take linear algebra? Oh, okay. And let's see that um, that's Hunter. Oh, okay. I'm just curious as to where you and 
in the back? Okay, okay. A useful class, a useful class, as math classes go, it's one of the more applied classes, which uh, I liked it. I took it a long time ago and I liked it for that reason. It's uh, okay. In fact, we just used a little bit of linear algebra that, that's the part that talks about solving systems of equations. Uh, so this is our problem. It's um, the triangular truss with six equations and six unknowns. We're going to, those six equations are going to be analyzing the sum of the forces equals zero. And the, X components and Y components that each node and that gives us six equations. And just the way we're going to do it, like I said previously, an internal, internal member force, if it's greater than zero, that means it's compressive. If it's less than zero, it means it's tensile. And we're going to define all the angles as angles less than 90 uh, and member. Uh, it's the angle between that particular member and a horizontal axis. So that means that doing it that way, all of our X components in the force balance equations are cosines and all of the, all of the Y components are sines. All right, just, that's just sort of the, that's actually how the truss analyzer works. All of, all of that sort of stuff is built into the analysis done with the Trust analyzer. And so uh, if you go through and look at what are the six equations, the way we're going to set it up is go from first to node one and then node two and then node three, sum the forces in the X, then sum the forces in the Y. And that gives you a total of six equations. Just as our example here for the Y force balance uh, at uh, node one, that's um, sines of the two angles and M1 and M3, that's, so there's, um, this is member one and this is member three, that's node one. So we'd have you know, the angle that this makes to the horizontal axis, the angle that that makes to the horizontal axis. Uh, we're assuming that everything's compressive if it's greater than zero, so it's pushing on the nodes, and you come up with this force balance equation. Likewise, you could do the same thing at node two, another summing the forces in the Y, you could do at node three, summing the forces in the X. Those are just examples of how you do that. And if we want to generalize how we write these equations, we could have these a coefficient that um, is double subscripted, where the first subscript indicates the member number. So that this coefficient, which is a sine or a cosine, is um, depends on the member number and the, whether or not it's x or y. And then the, the member force is single subscripted for just the member number. And so how we set that up, and then we move all of the the given information, the, the things that's not an unknown to the right-hand side of the equation. So we'll have on the left-hand side of the equations, we'll have coefficients times unknowns add, added up to a number that's on the right-hand side is just a, a constant. And that's the, that's the way that the system of equations looks, something like that. I've just shown two of the six possible equations using this nomenclature. Does that make sense? We're just, again, we don't, wouldn't necessarily know how 
know how to do it, but that it could be done. And so once we do the whole thing, what we end up with then is a, a system of six equations that we could write all at once um, using the, the methods in linear algebra as um, a matrix, uh, using matrix uh, algebra. And so what we say is that there is a six by six coefficient matrix that gets multiplied in matrix fashion times a column vector of unknowns and that's set equal to another column vector of whatever it is on the right hand side of the equation. So, okay, what are those three things, A, X, and B? Well, the A, it's got six rows, one for each equation, and it's got six columns, one for each unknown. And then each element is, for that particular element, the number that gets multiplied times um, that unknown in that equation. So equation one, member one, you'd have a coefficient in position one, one, row one, column one of our coefficient matrix. That's, that's how it works. Like I said, that this, um, column of unknowns has all, our, all of our member forces, first one to the last one, and then three more for the pin and roller. And then the, the right-hand side are the applied loads. Okay, so that's just, that's how it works. And it can be uh, generalized to any sort of, or any size uh, truss. So that this is as small as it gets would be a triangular truss with only six equations and six unknowns. But let's say uh, you're, you're doing one with 11 nodes, right? So if it's 11 nodes, then it's um, two times 11 is 22 minus three. It's got 19 members. Okay, so um, those 19 members and the three reaction forces are 22 unknowns. And the 11 nodes gives you 22 equations. So you could have a, a coefficient matrix that's 22 by 22. And what it would have is from the first node all the way down to the 11th node, it would have an X balance, a Y balance, an X balance, a Y balance through all 11 nodes. And then, and then in the columns, it would have member one, internal member force as an unknown, member two, all the way to uh, number 19 in the 19th column. And then in the 20th column would be P sub X, P sub Y, and then R. So any sort of, of um, trust can be set up uh, in, in this scheme as long as it's statically determined. Now we just have to figure out how to solve it using uh, linear algebra. But before doing that, just a, a, a short description of matrix multiplication to, to, so that you can see that it's actually this AX equals B that I've got here actually represents all of our equations in the, in the truss analysis. The way matrix multiplication works, again, for our uh, a, a really simple example, even simpler than our six by six, say that we have a, a matrix A that is three by three. That is, it's three rows and three columns. We call that a square matrix when the number of rows equals the number of columns. And the individual coefficients in that matrix, it's typical to have a, if this is the A matrix, 
typical to have uh, coefficients uh, specified with double subscripts where the first one indicates the i, I mean the ith row and the j column. Okay, so you're in row one and column three, then your coefficient is a13. If you're down here in row three, column two, then your coefficient is a32 and so on. And likewise, the, that same applies to the unknowns, the, the x column vector. It's only got a single column, so this j column stays at one, but it's got three rows. And that right-hand side with uh, uh, that's uh, likewise a column vector that would be B11, B21, and B31. Okay, so the way multiplication works is that if you want a particular element, say Bij, what you do is you dot the ith row of A with the jth row of X. So, um, we wanted, and uh, that gives us, in this case, that would give us uh, three separate equations. So we, we could take the first row and dot it with the, the one and only column to get B11. B11 would be gotten by dotting this row with that column. B21 would be dotting this row with this column. And 31 would be dotting this row with this column. And, and if you work through the example, you'd see that that gives us the whole set of equations that we're needing to specify our are, are the uh, static equilibrium at each of the nodes in any sort of truss. So this works for any truss. Uh, this is your coefficient matrix. These are your unknowns. And this is the, um, the applied loads on the right-hand side. All right. And I've got an example down there. And um, this, right, this is um, our example that we're working, that is the A matrix for that triangular truss. That's a six by six matrix. Uh, the unknowns are the three member forces, the two pin reaction forces in R and B are the external known loads on each of the nodes, right? And so there's the, how you set up the coefficient matrix, that is get the node one equation, the X balance, the Y balance and so on. And the three equations that I showed previously, I actually put in their particular uh, position in the A matrix. So let's just look at this one. This was Y balance on Y balance on node one going back. There it is. So it's uh, minus M1 sine A1. So that would be, um, this is A21, okay? Now, and so, and uh, which element of the A matrix is this? I'm gonna ask you. Think about it myself. Remember that it's AIJ 
and the I has to do with the row, which has to do with the equation. So this is a two because it's equation two and it's the j has to do with the column and that has that depends on the unknown so this would be the third column so that coefficient minus sine a3 goes into a23 and this goes into a21 see that Yeah, see there's negative sine A1. And then what's going on here? Okay, this is plus PY. So that's the pin force. And the pin force is in the X direction. So that's why this is that's why this is a one, oops, oops. and it's in the fifth column because it's the M1, M2, M3. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. That should be P sub Y, not P sub X. So it's M1, M2, M3, P sub X, P sub Y, and R. So that's why that's a plus one because the, the um, all right, so that's how it's all set up. This is the, that's the, the A's. We saw the X's before and that's the B. Here's how it turns out uh, that you can um, use the node information to give you the angles that you're looking for. The, the cosine of say angle one is just the difference in the X positions of member one over the length of member one. And so the node positions give you all the information you need about the sines and cosines. And that just sort of populate, that populates the A matrix. And then, um, so that's how you make the coefficient matrix. How do you solve it? Well, I like to think of matrix algebra having a scalar algebra equivalent. So if you think of, you know, there's uh, AX equals B, how would you solve for X? X equals one over A times B. And, and um, one over the A is uh, a to the negative one, well, there's a matrix equivalent of that. It's referred to as the matrix inverse. So if this is the unknowns you're trying to solve, you do that by finding the inverse of the coefficient matrix and multiplying it times the coefficient or the column vector, which is the right-hand side of our system of equations. And we just use Excel to do this for us. We, we give it an A matrix and then say, uh, find the inverse of that. There is an Excel function that'll do that for you. And then you have the column, it, the, uh, the matrix uh, uh, arithmetic is built into Excel. It's also built, you can, actually it's not built into VBA, which I discovered is that um, you have to do some sort of, um, there isn't a VBA function, but VBA can use Excel functions. So you have to actually get VBA to use an Excel function to do the matrix inverse. Okay, so just summing up how each of this works, we, um, Excel will give us, um, through its matrix algebra capabilities, it will give us the column vector of unknowns, which we combine with the calculation that is done within Excel of the 
the length of each member, the moments of each member. That's then used to calculate the strength, compressive and tensile. And then we go from there to get the safety factors. And from that, we can calculate the truss strength as the applied load times the minimum of the safety factor. And that's, that's the, the conceptual basis of what's going on in the truss analyzer. And I'm gonna leave it at that. We don't have any, uh, it's, you know, it's, I think it's good to know how it works. Um, but it's more important that you know how to use it, right? That's what, that's what you're actually gonna have to do is use it to analyze your trust. So I was gonna spend the remaining time just showing you that. It's a, it's a recapitulation of what was in lecture two, uh, but um, you're here, we're in person, so we can, you can ask questions while I, while I uh, show it to you. Any questions before we do that? Sorry to, to blast a bunch of this stuff at you with, um, I know, going over, uh, lecturing off of, of these notes this way is um, the least interactive way to do it, but we needed to get through a, a large amount of material. So we're done. And uh, have, you, have you designed your own truss in the truss analyzer yet? No, okay. So let's say that we were going to do one. I just, let's see now, will it? Don't know that it'll, if I'm screen sharing, does it? Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure that it's gonna show up on the presentation if I use either the dot cam or the screen. So I'm not gonna use either of those. What I am gonna do is, uh, open up the, the truss analyzer spreadsheet. This is what you can get from the Canvas page. Yeah, it's um, the truss analyzer, it's the Trust analysis macros combined with uh, information on how to calculate uh, strengths, or sorry, the uh, profits and benefits for using this, this semester's rules. So what it does have built into it are two example trusses. And this is, like I said, this is that five node, seven member truss. Uh, so what you, what you want is a truss that's got the correct span because you're gonna build a truss that sits on the, on the load frame. The load frame has two cylindrical supports that you set your truss on and they are spaced 24 inches apart. My recommendation is to make your, the length of your truss a little bit longer than that, so that um, even if you don't get, uh, even if your construction is not uh, exact to the 10th of an inch, you'll have enough to get, um, to, so that it, goes from one support to the other. So my, my I generally make them um, like this one is 24 and a quarter inches long. So that's, uh, and, and technically that's the distance between the nodes. 
Uh, and you know, you could think that that the actual length will be a little more because of the thickness of the wood, but I generally um, cut my members to these lengths and then put it together um, as best I can, mitering the joints to get a good mating surface between the, the pieces of balsa wood. So here's my truss, an example. It has five nodes. You put that here at the top, the number of nodes and members. It has seven members and five nodes. And then you just arbitrarily say, well, the left side is the pin and the right side is the roller or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. And the, um, I think what's helpful is to, is to draw out your, for a, a way to draw where people could see it. But um, my recommendation is to do something similar to what, what we did on the, what you see in the notes is draw out your truss, number each of the nodes, number each of the members. And then I typically draw it out on a couple of pieces of engineering paper that I put together so that it can be 24 inches long. So draw yourself out a, you know, a, 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 um, a, a full size drawing of your truss. And then just based upon the engineering paper, say, okay, in X and Y distances, where are each of my nodes located? And then, because that's the information you need in this table. That is, what's the X position and the Y position of each of your nodes. And then, once you have the nodes numbered and the members numbered, the next piece of information that that truss analyzer needs is for the first member to the last member, what are the node numbers that are at each end of the member, okay? So I see no way to avoid doing this. If you look at what's specified in simple trap based upon the X positions, nodes one, two, and three are from left to right on the bottom, and then four and five are on the top. So every member you need the node number that's the at the end of every member so let's just look at this we have seven members one two two three from bottom to top and left to right. Let's confirm that's true. So I can't see what's on the board, but 
is member one, does it have nodes one and two at each end? Yes. And I'll tell you that doesn't matter which order you put this. It, the analysis method works regardless of the order of the nodes. As long as it's uh, you've given the two node numbers, it's fine. And so you go from first member to last member. Member seven is that one at the top that connects member four and five, all these others uh, you specify the node number for each member. You also have to give it the size of the member. I've just, I've used quarter by quarter inch member size. And so what you end up having to do is filling in all of the stuff in green. All right, the last thing, once you get the node matrix specified and the member matrix specified, you have to specify the applied loads. And all you do is just say which of the nodes are going to be loaded. In this case, the load plate will sit on top of the truss and equally load, at least that's the assumption, nodes four and five. So up top here, you tell it, I have two applied loads, and those are on nodes four and five. This, uh, you shouldn't change this. I should not. Um, that's the standard value for Young's modulus and the tensile strength. Like I said, you specify this, but it doesn't ma matter which one's the node and which one, I, which one's the roller and which one's the pin. You can, as long as it's the lower corner uh, node, uh, you're you're good. All right. So if this were your trust, do you you see what you'd need to do to set up the um, these this uh, sheet? Make sense? Any questions? Now the question we had on Monday is, what do I do if there are more nodes and members? How do I do that? Well, let's say that we decided to. Um, Having trouble with that. It is, it is uh, statically determinate. You need more. You need more rows. Okay. Um, 
you need more rows. So what you would do is, if it's uh, nine members, It must be six nodes, two times six is 12, nine plus three is 12. So let's just say we had a nine member, six node truss. We still have um, two applied loads. So, and yeah, we've still got members um, one and three are, so here, what do we do to make this one? Well, we would need to add one row here. And then we need nine members, so we would add two rows here. The way the program works is it You don't have time to go through all of this, but you would do the same process that is specifying the, the nodes that are at the end of each member, giving it the appropriate sizes. Uh, if you mess it up, it'll tell you that you've messed it up. Let's see what happens if we just try to run it, because I wanted to show you how you run it. Oops. Okay, so, Oh, we need this too. Okay, let's just call it uh, two. So what happens if we, I would be very surprised if this actually works, but it, at least it has the right number of rows in our, in our, um, in these tables. How do you run it? Well, you add the developer tab to your ribbon. And then once you have that, you can run macros. You'll see that there's one and only macro called JB Trust that you would run. And then you give it the, the seat name that contains your I'm going to give it one that I haven't messed with just to show you how it works when it does work. So it goes through a first step where it checks everything to see if it looks okay from the checks that it does. And generally what it's doing is comparing this information up top to the information down below. And, and then from there, it goes on and does the trust analysis. And so it fills in all of this information and then um, calculates the, the strength of that particular truss. Here are the results. So it used simple trap one it said that it estimates it to be have a strength of that, and then depending on uh, how much it costs and how what sort of benefit it determines the profit, which in this case was negative. Now let's see if we tried to run it again. Okay, yeah, so it'll go through and it'll say problem with member seven, incorrect node number. So it's 
So this, uh, I'm not exactly sure how it knows that there's a problem with that node number, with that member, um, but it couldn't um, set up the, the system of equations to solve it, uh, so it stopped. Uh, but once you correctly specify these things, um, it will it will work. It will analyze it, uh, and you can. Uh, but like I said, I would recommend drawing out your truss so that you're sure where each of the nodes are located, and you're sure for each member what's the node at the end of each member, and then in the, you'll in most cases. Uh, that's enough to get to get it working. Any additional questions?